Hello again, friends, and you are our friends, <laughs> and welcome to another one of those editions of Jim Cornette's Experience, where we just don't know what the fuck might happen. Uh, we're going to have a good day today for you wrestling nerds out there. We're going to talk some old wrestling, Smoky Mountain Wrestling, Night of Legends, and wrestling television from the Territory Days in general with our good friend Mike Mills from the Book in the Territory podcast. I'm also going to knock that fucking orange idiot in the white house again and the lying sack of shit that he is and more shit that he's done to people to fuck with them uh but also otherwise now we're gonna have a good time and join me he is our friend hawaiian brian the podcasting lion the king of the arcadian vanguard podcast network mr co-host to you the man with a smile on his face the post office playboy swammy's pappy the proprietor of the French Toast Chateau, your friend and mine. He is, of course, the great Brian Last. Aloha, Jim. And what a pleasure it is to be here once again. <laughs> it sounds like we're on fucking Quaaludes. <laughs> Do they make those anymore? <laughs> you don't hear anything about the Quaaludes anymore, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, no, I... Once again, there's been so much going on in the in the world and in my world over the last week. I tried to escape. I tried to get away for a few days. And heaven forbid that I actually be allowed to take a day or two off. I, I mentioned this on the drive through we, that we recorded this weekend that that dropped, and, and never is a more apropos term been used, <laughs> that dropped. <laughs> shut up. That dropped this past Monday, like the turd in the punch bowl. And uh, I said, I, I got back from that trip for MLW in Chicago and the long hours there and and trying to to get the cornets collectibles out and 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 my other responsibilities i say you know what i've hit the wall as the big cat said you got to ring your brain out etc and so i was going to take 3 days and just and not phone and not twitter and not email eat some good wholesome food at home play with my puppy dog rest my brain and relax because we got the big season coming up. We got C2E2. We got MLW in New York and New York. We got uh, midnight express reunions. This is uh, uh, getting to be a busy time, right? I figure I'll, I'll take three days. Nobody will notice. Oh, shoot that thing. It, emails <laughs> have quadrupled and people trying to, and, and then they thought I'd got banned off of Twitter. Cause I've, you know, called for the bombing of people who eat dogs again, I guess. And they thought I'd been banned off Twitter. I remember a time where I didn't get up every day and look at the Twitter and look at the emails and it was so peaceful, but it just stacks up. And then and I want to let everybody know if you've ordered at Jim at Cornette's collectibles and bless you, bless your ever loving little pea picking hearts. Uh, between March 1st and March 13th, your shit is either already in your hands or is on the way by the time you can hear this. Except for five custom-made Mid-Atlantic DVD sets that are coming out this, this weekend, folks. So otherwise, but we got caught up with that. But in the process of trying to take three days away, that stockpiled. We got caught up with that now in the last few days. I've, I've emailed some people. Some people, it, it, I'm still searching, folks. Uh, if, if you haven't heard from me, I'm not dead. I'm just buried. So it is, so I'd never take a few days off to yourself to have some quiet, peaceful time and reflect and genuflect and object on things because it just makes you further behind. That's a, a piece of advice that you don't care to comment on. <laughs> I haven't taken a day off since 1987. Oh, for fuck's sake! You were what? Were you three in nineteen eighty-seven? I was seven. What you were? So was that you with that fucking big cigar out behind that <laughs> lemonade stand <laughs> well, wasn't... in the Bronx? You you were you were what you were doing was you had a series of lemonade stands all over the area, and you were muscling those five-year-olds. There's no such thing as the mafia. Yeah, that's that's what I've heard. Anyway, uh, so in my life now, ladies and gentlemen. Next week is C2E2, the Chicago Comic and Entertainment Expo, and the Have a Beef with Jim Cornette, which I can unfortunately say to you, well, unfortunately for you, fortunately for me, is soul slap dab out. Uh, we wanted to limit it to uh, 100 people so that we could uh, see everybody personally and et cetera. And then we added 10 tickets because I didn't give a proper last call on it. They were almost gone, and we sold those out, and no more can be had, but you can still see me at the Cornets collectibles booth 
at C2E2 Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. You just can't hang out for four hours like at the have a beef, or elsewise we're going to call security. But I can now at this time make, this is one of the most thrilling announcements, Brian, that I've ever made in conjunction with any of my appearances. I am, I have shaken to the core to find out that this was happening, that this was going to be possible. The have a beef with Jim Cornette at C2E2, for those of you who did get the tickets, is going to be, uh, the beef is going to be provided by none other than Al's number one Chicago Italian beef, baby. <laughs> the originators. The, 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 the men that often imitated but never duplicated. The people who made the Italian beef sandwich what it is in Chicago land. Al's Italian beef. That's what you're going to be eating, chomping down on the real thing, except no substitutions when it comes to a cornet appearance. And I am especially thrilled because you know, Brian, you know who Al's number one Chicago Italian beef with all those locations around Chicago, you know who they used to sponsor back 30, 35 years ago or more. Of course. None other. Oh. Well, go go ahead. <laughs> no, I thought you were asking me a question. I'm well, I'm, I'm, I was going to add, but I'm still building. Oh, but keep building. Thir- 30 or 35 years ago, none other than one of our heroes in the wrestling promotional industry, a legendary icon of pro wrestling in the city of Chicago and all of Chicago land. You know who our friend, your friend and mine, say his name. I wouldn't say hero, but Bob Luce. Bob Luce, baby. They used to sponsor Bob Luce back in the 70s and 80s. That's how Al's Italian beef, Chicago Italian beef, number one Chicago Italian beef, <laughs> has been around since 1938. <clears throat> but no, it, it, because Bob Luce was the first authority figure that I ever knew as a wrestling fan. Really? See, but we're going to break the, the commercial up here with a little known fact. Because... Bob Luce was a, a, he wrote for the Wrestling As You Like It magazine back in the 50s, and he was a PR guy and a publicity guy, and I don't know, he would have made a great used car salesman. He was one of those guys in Chicago in those days that, you know, he had the great laugh and he knew everybody, and the, he was fucking, you know, crazy as a rainbow trout in a car wash, you know, just fucking batty. And he was a character, and they used him as, when, when Bruiser and, and Wilbur Snyder uh, bought, or took the Indiana Territory, the WWA, and and Bruiser was the top guy. But Chicago was so big that Bruiser was in involved monetarily in Snyder and also Vern Gagne and a couple other partners. I can't even call it now, but they couldn't just come out and say that they were the promoters. So in Indiana, in the WWA, Bob Luce was presented as general manager matchmaker Bob Luce. <laughs> he was on, never on the fucking show. But because in Chicago, where he was more known and he was the guy that was sitting there at the sirloin room at the stockyards at the, with the uh, Wrestling Hall of Fame at the International Amphitheater, he was the one that was shaking everybody's hand. They called him, you know, promoter Bob Luce. But he was the figurehead. He was the guy. So when I first started watching... Bruiser's television show from Indianapolis, Sam Miniker would do the stand up local promos in the locker room set. And he would, after every Expo Center event, they would go to this detail to keep kayfabe. The Expo Center event ran from 7 30 to 11 o'clock on a Saturday night, right live. Well, Bruiser's TV had a nighttime airing on Channel 4 at like one in the morning. Well, obviously, they're not going to talk about what's happened that night because they fucking pre-taped this shit but it's alleged to be live right so the, if sam miniker <laughs> would stand there and say ladies and gentlemen what a great night of action we just saw at the expo center we'll have more next week but general manager matchmaker bob loose is at the hotel right now calling all the great wrestlers on the phone from all across the country <laughs> booking the next event for saturday night june 6th at the expo center in, Indi- in indianapolis and it, the way it was presented for my 11 year old mind, you could plausibly believe that these grown adult men who were allowed out late at night had gone to the television studio and were talking at, at one o'clock in the morning to all of the viewers, including me. <laughs> right. So at work, <laughs> but anyway, but you never saw Bob loose, but every once in a while they'd fuck up because they used the same interview set for Chicago promos. 
And every once in a while, like once every year and a half or so, they'd switch and they'd play the Chicago promos from <laughs> from in Indianapolis because they'd, they'd switch the tapes. It happened in wrestling back then, folks. And they, I would wonder why they were talking about the International Amphitheater in Chicago all of a sudden. But Bob Luce would pop in on those. And fuck it. it so anyway, I, I learned to love Bob Luce at a young age. And then when we got to see so much of him in the 80s during the Bob Luce Wrestling Classics uh, series where he did the comment, I, I, the commentary has never been done like that. Look at fans. It, he's David Crockett on steroids. The blood, <laughs> it's brutal. He's going to die. <laughs> and the programs. Yeah, that's the way the programs are written. Same he did way. the programs. They were put together like a ransom note. You had this giant, like, poster board sized piece of construction paper that they would print on both sides and fold in half. And it, like, he'd cut out words out of the magazines and newspapers like kill breed, deadly, <laughs> violent, <laughs> blood will fall. You know, what? <laughs> you know, <laughs> the brute. And uh, these, all these wild ass pictures, it was just, it was crazy. So, but he was, uh, as a matter of fact, to commemorate, and we're going to be talking more about Al Chicago, number one Chicago Italian beef in the weeks to come. You can bet your bottom dollar on that because they're being betty, betty good to me. Uh, but to commemorate the occasion of this announcement, we have audio. This is on YouTube, folks. And we and we're going to give you so you we're going to give you a link so you can see it, but we can play it also right here now. This is a Bob Luce commercial from like 19 fucking 79, maybe. I don't know. Moose was out there with Yukon Moose Cholak, the legendary one for, for Al's number one Chicago Italian beef. And if you want to view it, then you can go to tinyurl.com slash Bob and Al's beef, right? <laughs> That's right. It, is that way you can find it real easy. But but let's play this now. This is Bob Luce, everybody. I'm Bob Luce here with a member of Pro Wrestling's Hall of Fame, Yukon Moose Cholak. Moose and I are longtime pals and longtime fans of Al's number one Chicago's Italian beef. You could say we're all Chicago legends in our own time. I got a lot to be thankful for, Bob. What I need now is an extra hand to eat Al's Italian beef sandwiches. Two are never enough. Moose, you're just too much. Even for Al's number one Chicago's Italian beef. <laughs> <laughs> and that was Moose Cholak chewing on his sandwich going num, 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 num. He doesn't look at Moose Cholak once. He just stares at the camera the whole time. <laughs> oh, God. One of those characters, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to talk about all that and more in Chicago at C2E2. Uh, and I will have a full line of collectibles at the Cornette's Collectibles booth. But if you can't be in Chicago, then go to jimcornette.com. Because now, as I mentioned, we are caught up and now shipping shit as swiftly as shit deserves to be shipped. Uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, let's clear up the live events now. Remember, I will be back with MLW, Major League Wrestling. There are two television events in New York City over uh, WrestleMania weekend, April 4th and 5th at the Melrose Ballroom. They're in New York. Uh, not only a live two-hour BN special, Battle Riot, but also some television tapings for the next number of weeks afterwards. That's the only place I'm going to be in public in New York City that weekend for anybody because that's i've i've given up sleep already for fuck's sake i'm not going to be flitting around like a social butterfly everywhere so if you want to see me see me there um april 13th in madison west virginia midnight express the all-star wrestling hall of fame hustler rip rogers added to induct us and this is I, just for that alone this is can't miss Stephen p news is going to be there bobby fulton tracy smothers whole bunch more April 27th in Concord, North Carolina, the Crockett Cup. Not only will I be calling the action uh, for the NWA on the broadcast that night, but also the Crockett Cup legends, myself, all three members of the Midnight Express, Nikita Koloff and Magnum TA are going to be there at the VIP meet and greet. Uh, May 18th in Richmond, the two-man power trip podcast, Con 3. I'm also going to be doing the VIP uh, experience in Richmond. Separate ticket is required, but we're going to have pizza in Richmond. Uh, and then, of course, uh, more dates in the, the summertime and fall to be announced uh, and already are up in some cases at jimcornette.com. Click on events 
And I want to thank the folks at BN Sports because they did. Did you see the nice piece they did on me? Meet Jim Cornette, a mini documentary for the young fans that that weren't born when I was already fucking farting dust. I did. I was like, man, everything with him contains the word meat. Of what? It, no, this is M E E T. It was. It's you know. But I guess Al's number one Chicago <laughs> Italian beef can meet. But anyway, <laughs> do you think I've said that enough so far today? But anyway, B N Sports did a nice piece. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tweet out a link to that on my Twitter when I get a chance to go through the rest of those emails where I've lost it. Uh, but anyway, that's what's coming up, and and everything else is operating as normal, and we're gonna try to tape the drive-throughs ahead of some of these trials and travels and travails upcoming, as well as the experience, so we don't miss any programming. And we got the YouTube thing operating now right as of this very second yes well be thankful for small favors that's right they can go to official tinyurl.com slash official corny youtube or just go to youtube and search for jim Cornette. it will be the very first thing that pops up because the one thing we know is that it is official it is official officially this is the official place on youtube Okay, before I t- before I talk about pig face, and then we get Mike Mills on here to uh, to bring me back into a good mood. What are you doing this week on your eighteen programs? Uh, just a few notes here. I want to mention that this week on Stick to Wrestling with John McAdam and Sean Goodwin, the boys are going to talk about King Kong Bundy and his legacy in wrestling, as well as more talk about nineteen eighty one WWF. You can hear that at McAdamPod.com or available wherever it is that you find your favorite podcasts. This week on Breaking Kayfabe with Baldrin and Barry, the boys welcome Tully Blanchard onto the show. Find out if he gives Jeff Baldrin the slingshot suplex this week at baldrinpod.com or wherever it is that you find. I think, I think he'd be better off these days going for, for Barry because Baldrin's a little fleshier than Barry is. Well, that's not very nice, but you can hear that at baldrinpod.com or wherever it is that you find your favorite podcast. And of course, the 605 Super Podcast, the Mothership! <laughs> well thank you i'll take that as a compliment here at this point in the show i want to thank everyone for checking out episode 96 episode 97 is in production right now but we have an episode we're going to be putting out later today as the day that this comes out thursday wait a minute are you saying there's an episode 97 b the episodes that are specials aren't in sequence with the normally numbered episodes <laughs> So we have a very special episode looking at the career of the Destroyer, Dick Beyer, who just recently passed away. We talk with Fumi Saido about his career in Japan, George Shire about his career as Dr. X in the AWA, and Jeff Walton about his career in Los Angeles and Southern California for the WWA, touching on many, many topics. Check that out at 605pod.com or available wherever it is that you find your favorite podcast, The Mothership. And of course, I know you know your friend, what was it, Big Dick Hertz? Was that his name when you knew him? Yeah, well, as a matter of fact, the first time that I met the Destroyer, because obviously, you know, when you grew up in the 70s reading the wrestling magazines, he had the the mask ads where he sold the Destroyer mask. And because he was Dr. X in the AWA, he had another mask he could sell, and they were different. Yeah. And the, the Dr. X mask covered his nose because his nose was so distinctive as the Destroyer. Um. But anyway, so I'd, you know, grown up, but I never got a chance to see him. He never worked this territory. And and by, you know, the time that I was uh, in in the business as far as taking pictures, et cetera, he had pretty much slowed down and retired. So at any rate, he finally comes to Mid-South when we were down there in 1984 because he had trained this kid named Mark Reagan. And he was, I don't know, he worked for a few years and I guess he found something else to do, but it probably the territory constriction, but he was a real good young athlete, a good, nice black kid. And in exchange for Watts agreeing to use the guy in, in his territory, Dick Byer said he would come down and work the loop around for two weeks, putting him over in his first night everywhere. And so you had this situation where here's this internationally known superstar. He is the real destroyer. This is not, I'm sure the people came and they thought, well, this fucking can't be the real guy, right? He'd, he'd never worked that territory. So they didn't really know what he would look like well anyway, but they probably thought he was a mass job guy, maybe till they saw him wrestle. But he's an international fucking legend in the business, and he's opening the, the, the show every night putting this rookie kid over. 
but they were great matches, not only because he trained him, but because he knew how to work the people. He instantly, <clears throat> even though the people didn't know who he was necessarily and didn't know it was the real destroyer and by that point may not have cared and he had never worked the territory, by the time he got in the ring and was introduced, he was the heel. Everybody knew exactly what the fuck was going on. The way he walked out, the strut, the way he carried himself when he got in, he looked at the ring announcer with disdain. He argued with the people a little bit. He scoffed some of them off. He was a heel. And then here comes this flashy young kid. And immediately the people are on his side. And Watts' opening matches on his house shows usually had a one fall 20 minute time limit. That's just the format they used. And they didn't usually go 20. Dundee was, you know, booking at that time. We had six, seven matches on the card. He would tell Dick Byer every night, he'd say, well, get, you know, eight or 10 or 12 and put the kid over. And Dick would do 19 minutes and 30 seconds, right? Every, <laughs> uh, because he's he, he actually, after the first few nights, he said, but Bill, how do you have a match in less than 20 minutes? He would just, he was old. He had to build the story, get the kid over, get some heat, give him a comeback. All those things took time, right? And, and they were great matches. But finally, just to save some of the rest of the show, I think the second week around, because we were in two-week loops because every big town ran every two weeks so that the TV could follow it. The second week around the territory, they lowered it to a one-fall 15-minute time limit. So then he'd go 14.30, and he'd put him <laughs> <laughs> But he also taught me he was a heel even though he had no heat at that point, you know, in that territory. The first thing he'd do every night is he would come out in his hood. He'd never entered the building without the hood or left the building without the hood. But he would come in or come out of the locker room right before the first match because there would be the cops, the security. And they were uniformed police in those days in the Mid-South Towns. And they'd be standing there waiting to, you know, for the first match. And he'd walk up and introduce himself. He'd stick his hand out. Hey, guys, how you doing? Big Dick Hurts. He wouldn't tell him his name, but he wouldn't bullshit him with a fucking, hi, I'm the destroyer. So he had a way around it. And he would fucking talk to him and fucking make him happy for a couple minutes. Just so he, they knew, okay, this guy's all right. If anything happens, we might ought to maybe take care of him. It was just, it was classic old school heel tricks. But, uh, you know, just a, a great athlete. I mean, from a, a shooter to to being a legend in Japan, to being so important to the, you know, to this day and <clears throat> in Buffalo and that area and, you know, being such a well-known celebrity there. So, you know, but my God, what was he? 80 something heavens. He was mid eighties. He had his own merch business for like 60 years. Yeah. <laughs> Think exactly. about that. Yeah. I mean, no one was doing that before him. I mean, very, if anyone did, it wasn't at the level he did it. You said it. He had a Dr. X ad. He had the destroyer ad. And even if you never saw him wrestle, you wanted those masks because they look so cool. And and the T-shirt is a famous picture with Deborah Harry wearing the T-shirt and and little else. Uh, any, but yeah, Dick Byer, he was a cool guy. So that'll be a good show for everybody to listen to by Cracky. Was that the end of your plugs? I, I believe so. I can keep going. I have like 50 more shows. Well, I, I, I know you can, but th thankfully the people would cut their throats by this. No, I just, before we get Mike on the phone. I'm not going to talk about the fact that fucking Trump's inner circle has more sentences than war and peace. Manafort, they're, they're, they're getting Manafort now state and federal so that he's pardon proof. They're trying to, they're trying to put these fucking criminals in their places <clears throat> and hopefully sooner or later, they'll get to the fucking main cry, Gambino crime family of politics, the Trump's themselves. However, I'm not even going to talk about all the criminality. And all the stupidity and all the lying and all the fucking bullshit that we've had to put up with just one thing, the budget. Remember when they cut the taxes for all the rich billionaires and all of his buddies and these big corporations and all the people that that we need guys like Stephen P. New to protect us from? They cut the, the taxes is that all the, oh, they'll bring all the money back and they'll invest in jobs, they'll invest in businesses and factories the GDP is going to grow. If this is all going to pay for itself, folks, guess what it didn't do? It didn't pay for itself, that's for sure. It didn't pay for itself. No, because the companies bought their own stock back like everybody said they were going to do and blah, 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 <clears throat> and, and didn't build all the, the factories they were going to build. So 
now they present the budget and to come up with that oh one point something almost two trillion dollars that they just fucking uh, blew up a hole in the budget with you remember how he said from his own lying lips that resemble the sphincter surrounding a pig's anus he said well i'm not going to touch social security and medicare and medicaid guess what he's going to touch Apparently you can't. Well, I, I thought that was a rhetorical one this time. Uh, <laughs> no, I thought you'd feed me at least a little bit on this. He's not, he's going to touch Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid. In the new budget, he is cutting over a trillion dollars from all those things. Now, some of it is tied up in some hoo-ha where you can't tell he's really cutting it until you get down to the to the bottom of it. So it's going to fool a lot of the fucking sucker gullible Republicans. But no, and for the people around the world who live in civilized countries with normal, sane leaders, Medicare is when you get to be 62 years old and you might be retiring. And, you know, we got the highest health care costs in the world in the United States. So Medicare is supposed to help you with part of your medical expenses when you get old. And Medicaid is supposed to help poor people who can't afford luxuries like doctors and medicine to get those things. And Social Security, once again, is when you're old and decrepit and society has kicked you aside, you get a pittance from the government for all the fucking shit you did for them all those years while you were fucking slaving away to pay all the medical bills that they never fucking took care of for you because we don't have medicine in this country like everybody else does. We got a goddamn racket. But anyway... That's what Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid is. And they, so he wants to cut from old people, poor people, and sick people almost as much as he lost on giving all the rich people the tax cuts. I just wanted that to be first and foremost this week when we think about how those fucking spineless, gutless, criminal-minded, beady-eyed, shysterish fucking Republicans with balls so microscopic that if you rolled them toward the proverbial storm drain, it would look like two kernels of corn rolling into a goddamn drinking straw or whatever the fuck my phrase is. They sit there and still say, no, there's nothing wrong with this guy. They point at him, say, there's nothing fucking wrong with him. Everything's good. Nothing to look at. Nothing to see. We shouldn't impeach him. He's not a crook. We, we should listen to what he says. He's not a liar. We, we should go ahead and just give some more money to him and his family and friends and just let the sick people pay for it. This is what we got. If he lies about everything, why do we believe him when he says he doesn't drink? You know, I think if he drank, he'd make more sense and probably be more fun. I don't know. At least he'd sleep longer instead of being up 5 a.m. tweeting about Fox and Friends. He's the typical 70-year-old you see in a bar in Queens. I mean, I know what kind of guy he is. Well, I think we ought to put him back at a bar in Queens somewhere. <laughs> so he can tell people about how he used to be president. And they'll say, oh, that's that old fucking bum from down the street. He doesn't make any sense. Well, speaking of not making any sense. <laughs> That's better than I thought you were going to say speaking of Queens. <laughs> <laughs> no, Mike Mills would never forgive us. Because, no, speaking of speaking of Queens that don't make any sense, ladies and gentlemen. Here, let's just get out of that whole bit. Um, should we get Mike on the phone to talk about the Night of Legends, a subject near and dear to my heart? I believe he's on standby right now, so let me add him to the call. All right, well, on the line with us now, our friend from the Booking the Territories podcast, who also has been reviewing over the past couple of years the Smoky Mountain Wrestling Television Library episode by episode, and he's also a huge fan of Al's number one Chicago Italian beef, even the Chicago <laughs> hot dogs, homemade hand-cut French fries and Polish sausages, and more that you can find at Al's number one Chicago Italian beef. But right now he's on the experience. Mike Mills, everybody. Mike, hello. How are you? Man, I'm I'm on with Jim Cornette and Brian Lass on the Jim Cornette experience. So as my buddy, Hard Body Hopper, my co-host on Booking the Territory always says, I'm living a dream, brother. I got to say, I'm honored to be back, Jim. 
Well, and you that that'll rub off quickly here because we don't know whether to wind our ass or scratch our watch today. But um, you have been doing a program where you t- and by the way, nobody can tell you're from Louisiana just by the way you talk. By the way, <laughs> nobody can ever guess that. Uh, but it, it, being a Mid South wrestling fan, you you've been on your programs. You've not only been reviewing. Mid-South Wrestling, which we'll talk about, but also the Smoky Mountain Show, as I mentioned. And you've got to the point where you're up to what I think was my favorite landmark moment in in Smoky Mountain, which was the Night of Legends uh, event, which, by the way, is on on sale on DVD at jimcornette.com for the incredible price of $9. So I get anal raped every time somebody buys one. Um, was that, I mean, is that your favorite so far? Or if, do I just look back on it fondly because it was, it was my favorite. Uh, it's a, it's a, tre- it's a tremendous night. And, and this is going to sound really crazy, but I, I won't say it's my favorite, but top five for sure. Because I look back at like when dirty white boy wrestled Tracy Smothers in that chain match for the yeah. uh, wrestling heavyweight title. Uh, to me, that's, just one of the best, not only matches, but just chain matches and best night I've seen. The way the people erupted when White Boy won, and how, I'm sorry, when when Tracy won and how he won was just good. But Night of Legends was was just so fun in so many ways. Uh, it's hard to gloss over because we are enamored with the gangsters on our show and <laughs> Jack just. I mean, I got questions about it, and I know I've talked to you about New Jack a lot already, but it's a tremendous night, and New Jack and his heel promo was great. I want to say one other thing about that night. When I was talking to Les Thatcher a couple of weeks ago on Booking the Territory, because we had him on, we did a two-part interview. I didn't know this, but, I mean, it makes sense. I just hadn't given it much thought. Les was telling me how it was he and JR's first time together doing commentary. You would never notice that by the way those two called that night. You'd never notice it. That's how great oh. they were. Well, yeah, because they they knew they were both great uh, commentators. And and Les had done play-by-play and also been a color man. And they just knew what they were doing, and they fit together perfectly. Of course, JR was tremendous with his preparation. He already knew a lot of those guys. But, uh, you know, of course, I've provided plenty of notes uh, uh, on, you know, things that have been going on. JR, but that was the period of time where he was doing our program, and – Les was coming in doing the special events, and that's the one time we got them both together because um, I I did a full television taping at that event because I thought this, and 20, 25 years later, is still paying off. We still got some of the DVDs, but I did a full television shoot because not only was it going to be a big live event, and we did our, our record gate to that point, but also I wanted to get a one-hour episode of television out of it to showcase you know, Smoky Mountain Wrestling and our stars in that environment, the Knoxville Coliseum jam packed like that. It, you know, it just, it was a major league building as opposed to the high schools and rec centers and things we usually tape television in. And then a home video, because I knew that, that we would end up making money with that down the line, which we have a a few times since then. So, you know, I wanted to get the best commentary team possible and, and we hit the home run with that too. Yeah, it was a good night. I mean, I'm thinking just, you know, uh, the the two matches that, or the the couple of matches that they show on TV that are obviously uh, the main ones were the 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 tag match, and then well, with Jericho and Storm, which was, uh, I still I, I got to ask you about that, Jimmy. Let me, before I even go any further, let me just ask, w- w- did that match go about as well as you could expect with them versus the Heavenly Body? <laughs> Jericho well, broken off. Yeah, under the circumstances that one of the competitors has a freshly broken arm, it it, it exceeded expectations. Um, and I've told this story a couple times places, but my original plan that night for Jericho to bleed was for him to do a bump that he had done at a little high school gym a couple months beforehand. He had against one of the Infernos, masked Infernos in a preliminary match. He had shot the guy off into the turnbuckle, boom, and he charged him, and the guy ducks, and Jericho dives at him but goes over the top turnbuckle, hits his head on the ring post, and lands out on the floor. Goddamn just bumped I've ever seen in my life. I said, don't ever do that again in a high school gym like this because it, it, it is dangerous, but also save that for a big show in the Coliseum when you need to get juice. And, and and that's when we're going to do it. And so I've got the heavily bodies coming in to put the thrill seekers over sold out Knoxville civic Coliseum TV shoot. 
the whole nine yards and Jericho ends up with a, a broken arm as, as we famously talked about in the ring by himself, practicing, doing a shooting star press that he didn't, it didn't even need to do that night. And so he comes back and to his credit works with the broken arm, but now he can, there's no way he can do that bump with a broken arm, but he's still going to get the juice. <laughs> And he ended up almost bleeding to death at the, well, I won't say that that's a little harsh, but he lost a significant amount of blood in that match. We didn't get any complaints, uh, when we showed it on our television network, but the TV stations and them, their Hills were, were used to bloody matches, but it was, it was gruesome to see, but it got the thrill seekers over. If that had not been their last ever match as a team, they would have been over like God. <laughs> oh, well, Speaking of them being over and, and they would have been over like God at that point. I, the big question I had about the thrill seekers in general, because, you know, Jericho breaks his arm. You really can't do anything with him. And then you kind of have uh, storm do some, some single stuff, which was, which was good. What was the plan? Like, what were you going to do with the thrill seekers beyond that? If Jericho never breaks his arm? Well, the idea was obviously just to the rock and roll express were still strong, but you always need fresh faces and new names. And so the idea was to get the thrill seekers over with heavily bodies where that they would then, who was the champions? Lee and Candido, right? The Lee and Candido were the champions. Uh, Rock and roll did beat them that night, but then they flipped it back and then back again. So yes, uh, but basically the when, when, when the rock and roll express got some kind of closure with Lee and Candido, the, Lee and Candido would, would have come out with the belts and would have then, worked with the thrill seekers and, and put the belts on Lance and Chris while the rock and roll got in a personal issue with, uh, somebody else and, and gave them a rest from being the top team all the time. Then to be honest, although at that point it was merely mental masturbation as, as Vince McMahon might say, then we had to see is the rock and roll still as popular as ever are the thrill seekers, the new phenomenons or, or, They've got to meet which side will the people be on and then manipulate it that way. Yeah, it could have been, you know, it could have been, but we're talking a year, year and a half. So the the most immediate thing was just to give the Rock and Roll Express a chance to have a rest on top and get a new team over as as being legitimate championship material. And so it, the, it didn't quite get that far. So the plan, the plan still was, I mean, even, even if Jericho doesn't break his arm, the rock and roll express end up in a feud with the gangsters and, and Chris and, and Lance storm are, are going to end up, I guess, going back and forth with Candido and Lee, but, uh, eventually yeah. they're going to have the thrill seekers and rock and roll meet each other. Well, you know, if, if it called for, if the thrill seekers didn't get over as strong as, as they should, then my, they might be heels or that it might not come up at all. Maybe they're the, just the secondary baby face team. But, you know, it, it, those things, you, you had to kind of feel those things as it went. I thought they had the potential to be popular. But also, yeah, the thing with the rock and roll and the gangsters, because you knew you had to have Ricky Morton selling for New Jack and that fucking nightstick and et cetera, et cetera. But also Lance and Chris could have really great athletic matches with especially with Candido, obviously, and, and with Brian Lee. So that it was just it was. A new look. We ended up, we got the rock and roll and the gangsters. We just didn't get Lance and Chris and et cetera. Gotcha. Spe speaking of the gangsters, Jim, if I can ask, early on, they would get frisked before their matches. Um, Bob Cotto and Les Thatcher sold this so <laughs> well. Um, whose idea was it for them to get frisked like criminals? for weapons instead of getting checked in the uh, traditional manner? Well, you know, I remember that now, and I think we were probably sitting around in the locker room and it, the idea was not that the referees were forcing them to be frisked. The idea was when the referee, because once again, we were doing professional wrestling. So the referee at the start of the match would check the competitors for grease and foreign objects and shit like we used to. So the idea was when the referee would go up to do the normal check of the toe of the boot and everything that the gangsters would turn around and just assume the position leaning on the top rope. Like they were so used to this. I think it was probably their idea. And it popped us, so so they did it. <laughs> and then, as as you know, then they started getting more violent into more you know uh, issues and everything. And I think we slacked off on it. But yeah, that's the thing is, it, I told 
New Jack mainly. Mustafa was there to be the the enforcer and the muscle, and D'Lo was there to be the worker and drop the falls. New Jack was the mind of the thing. And I said, I can't tell you what to say or how to say it because that's you and what a promo he was. But the as he said, I said, piss white people off. You know, it, it's it's all over the news. Uh, you know, the Rodney King beating, the the troubles in Los Angeles, etc. So. Just be fucking gangsters from the hood and you don't give a fuck about anybody but yourself, which came in handy when they didn't even give a fuck about me. And I, I was able to switch babyface to assist the rock and roll and, and open up new avenues we could go in because they didn't like the other heels either. They were, it was just their, their group. But so at new Jack, when he went out there, he just, he turned it on and got in that zone and he said some outrageous shit today would get kicked off TV. But, you know, I'm not trying to, to <laughs> duck the blame as far as I didn't tell him to say that, but I couldn't tell him to say that. Uh, you know, when he said, you silenced Medgar Evers, you silenced Malcolm X, you silenced OJ or whatever the fuck or whoever's next. I've got, I couldn't come Arsenio up with that. Arsenio Hall. Yet. Arsenio Hall. You, you kicked him off television. And the great thing was, because I told JR, I said, now, this guy can fucking talk, right? And we're uh, edgy here. But when they came out, JR standing in the ring, he introduces them. This is the, and once again, it looked major league because we've got 5,000 people there in the audience watching these fucking guys. And we play the music and they took their time on the entrance. And also, New Jack brought some of his friends up from fucking Atlanta. So there could be a posse. This was before D Lo got there. And they come out with their hands in these fucking brown paper bags, like the, from the liquor store. What have they, is it a bottle in there? We don't fucking know. And they're looking around. It was, it, it looked legitimate and the way new Jack talked, you could tell this was not made up shit. He means this shit. Yeah, and it, so it just, it was maybe a little early and maybe a little South of the right place. But if that had been, you know, a few years later on the attitude era, uh, it would have made some noise. Uh, the way he called out the Knoxville chapter of the NAACP, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Will always get me just to raise my eyebrow. New Jack was a force of nature. One other thing you're, you're and, talking about. And I think also, I can't remember, it may have either been been JR or maybe it was, good gosh, I can't remember, but somebody came up with the disclaimer idea. My, maybe less, I can't remember, but were the views of the gangsters are not necessarily those of Smoky Mountain Wrestling or this station. And it, it, nobody asked us to do that, but it made it look like, my God, this is even more out of bounds. Yeah, it, and uh, and I remember you telling me that once before that, you know, you didn't have to do that, but it certainly, I mean, even watching back now when we watch it and we watch the, the Chiron at the bottom of the screen, it, we know it wasn't, you know, made to be there, but, or or you didn't have to put it there, but you look at it and it just feels like, no, this is real. <laughs> He's, I mean, he, he just called out the NAACP. He, he, he called well, them. You, uh, you know why they, you know why they, the NAACP sellouts, you know why he did that? Because somebody had actually called or written Sandy Scott when the, the first couple of times that they were on television or the promo or whatever, that was their first big, you know, coming out party. But and and said something about, well, we don't know how these people are being presented or something like that. And Sandy gave him the old line. Hey, we can't tell these guys what to say and what not to say. You know, they're independent contractors. This is all him. And, and when he told new Jack about it, new Jack got hot. He said, they're trying to keep me off television. I finally, if one of brother gets a job and they want to knock him off TV. Fuck them. <laughs> so he went, oh, it was real. Yeah. <laughs> he said, those NAACP sellouts can kiss my black ass. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> Oh, man. And that was the way he felt about it. So, by gum. Anyway, that was, uh, yeah, JR was, he was like, what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> J and, and we felt like when you watch it, when you watch it back now, for anybody out there who hadn't seen it, you, you got to see it. When you do watch it, JR, to, to us, at least viewing it again, he legitimizes it. Like, because JR was a name, he was a, he was a big time announcer. And on commentator and him being in that ring with New Jack going through that promo, you look at New Jack and go, man, this man means business. I mean, he's in there with Jr. 
This is real. This is real. This is the real deal. This dude is not here to play. And JR makes it legitimate. So it was just a just a amongst, you know, that the rock and roll. Um, you know, you had the Legends match on the show with Bob Orton Jr. Dick Slater. Oh uh, man, and you know what? That was my Garvin. it was all great. That the Legends match was one that fuck. I was so pissed because and you and now I'm gonna tell you this, you go, oh shit, now you'll never look at it the same way. Mac McMurray, the legend referee, did was not supposed to see the tag that he saw. <laughs> they had built this for so that they had a good old fashioned seventy style tag match. The work was incredible. It was Ronnie Garvin and the Stomper and Bob Orton Jr. and Dick Slater. What a great tag team they were! And they built this heat on Ronnie Garvin, and Ronnie sold so that he could finally give the Stomper the big tag. Well, he gave he gave him a false tag. And they pulled him back, and he was going to give him another one. And Mac didn't get distracted. He was distracted. He was too distracted to be distracted and saw the tag that the Stomper made, and he let and he let it go. And they would have really had a, a – I mean, the people popped anyway. And did you know that, by the way? Did you sense that? I did didn't. I just tell you? No, you just you just ruined it for me, Jim. I Thank just you. ruined it for you forever. See, and there's no Santa Claus either, motherfucker. And the Tooth Fairy we've already established from Brian Last Kids is bullshit. Um, but if they'd have waited for until one more tag, it would have even been better. But that that work was so good. And then, you know, we we just had different styles of guys up and down the card. And I thought that uh, you know, that all in all, but the the legend ceremony and the segments that we did leading up to it were the biggest part for me. Though those are also, uh, by the way, included in the DVD release available at jimcornet.com. But, um. The the packages that we did with Les, I wrote to voiceovers. He sat down and did them. We got so much the B-roll footage, even stuff of Whitey Caldwell's from Nancy, his widow. And we, I had such a good time putting those together because it told the story of wrestling in Knoxville and how it had been important to people for so long. And those guys were in the papers all the time. They were on the biggest TV station in town for so many years. You know, it, it was just it was a part of East Tennessee. Uh, even if I've mentioned when I used to go in some of the, the TV stations trying to get on the air, they might not put us on the air, but the general manager, when he was 10, was sneaking under the fence at Chilhowee Park to see Ron Wright or whatever. So th- those segments and that buildup to give those guys their recognition, I thought the people really enjoyed it. And for a local television show, the last uh, airing before the night of legends where we recapped all of the legend segments and, and the people around town had gotten interested. We had the spectrum rent sponsorship, the whole nine yards. We did an eight rating, not a share, but an eight rating for Smoky mountain TV the week before the night of legends, which I, you know, to me was uh, definitely indicative that people were interested. We already knew the advance was going to be big, but a lot of people watched that didn't normally watch our program because of those guys' names. And the eight rating was done without Tim Horner going to all the electronic stores and turning on the <laughs> Pokemon wrestling. Let's make that point. I swear to God, he said that with a straight of face as serious as a heart attack. For the new listeners, ladies and gentlemen, my erstwhile, one of the assistants I had operating this fucking fiasco of Smoky Mountain Wrestling was Tim Horner who, when I made the comment that when our first airing in Knoxville, when we first started, I said, I hope every TV set in town is tuned to Fox 43 in Knoxville on Sunday morning. And he said, well, I ought to go down to that big appliance store and put every single one of those TVs on display on so our ratings will go up. All right. Anyway. Hey Jim, the middle of '94, you know, Dirty White Boy that night. It's it's not on the the weekly episode. He uh, he wrestled Terry Gordy, but I got a question about White Boy. As we go through '94 uh, with Dirty White Boy, Tony Anthony, it's a, it's a weird thing through no fault of his own. I I've been dying to ask you this, and I just got to know how much do you think the Jake the like the Jake Roberts angle not paying off. Uh, the way it should have because Jake kind of disappeared. How much do you think Dirty White Boy and maybe hurt the promotion since, you know, Dirty White Boy, they got the Smoky Mountain Wrestling Heavyweight title involved in this. Uh, did that hurt the promotion much? And um, not only the promotion, but again, White Boy, how much did it hurt him? 
I, you know, I think, I don't think it hurt him. I think it left him with uh, uh, not as much to do for a couple months to contribute to the cards because we had to scramble and put him back in a deal with Bruiser Bedlam and other stuff and everything. So for a couple months, there was just fill in stuff there, but it wasn't, it, I don't think it hurt white boy in the people's eyes. I think it just it gave him less interesting stuff to do there for a while. I, you know, once again, in those days also, I don't think it hurt the promotion because when we announced that white boy defeated Jake Roberts in Bluefield, West Virginia, by God, <laughs> I did that because that's where Jerry Lawler beat Robert Fuller for the or Ron Bass or somebody for the Southern title about 15 years before that one time in a phantom switch. Um, and our TV aired pretty much around Bluefield, but what the, f- <laughs> the, <laughs> the point is, to be honest, Jake Roberts didn't draw enough of a house when he did show up to hurt the promotion when he quit showing up. Mm. Um, except the first night that he was in, Randy Savage was on the same card. That was the volunteer slam that year in Knoxville. And that we did a nice house. And then when Jake returned the following times, which was of uh, the night of the OJ Bronco chase and in freedom hall the night afterwards, Knoxville died. And I understood that because everybody was watching OJ, but the next night it wasn't even a great house for freedom hall. And then the next month when he no showed the people didn't know he wasn't going to be there until they got there and the houses were nothing to write home about. Mm. So uh, it started out good because we had the artificial inflation from Randy Savage being on, on the volunteer slam, but and I'm not knocking Jake, but I, I was trying to find a new big name to compete for the championship to give Tony Anthony a main event opponent and, uh, you know, and make the title more important and hopefully draw some money. And if Jake had have made those dates, I pr- I would probably cut it off after August anyway, because originally it was going to be the blow off at the Night of Legends with Dirty White Boy and Jake. And at that point, I probably would have seen that Jake was not setting the box office on fire past guys that we could control and have on all our spot shows. But uh, yeah, that, that, that's why sense. Terry was there. Uh, and to be honest, Terry had j- Gordy had just started back wrestling after the the health issues and the coma on the plane and the whole nine yards. And people had said, yeah, he's, he's doing well. And it's Terry Gordy and it's Knoxville. He lives down the road. He's a huge name. Tony could work with him. He let's be, he wasn't the Terry Gordy that he would come back and be the next year in the ring. It was disappointing. Uh, but so that was probably not the bright spot of the show just because Terry was not the Terry Gordy that he used to be. But out of respect, uh, Tony had the best match with him he could have. And Terry did get better the following year. He was, he was up there regularly for us from summer to fall. Uh, he never regained the, the Terry that he was at, you know, at, at first, but he, he came back somewhat, but night of legends was not a good showing. Yeah. But o- overall, I mean, it, it was, uh, it was for the TV episode. Let me say it's a fun episode. I, again, I I'm partial to the new Jack segment and then Jericho and <laughs> bodies was, 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 was great. And what uh, what else? What, el- what other match was on the show? Was it the rock and roll Lee and Candido? Yeah, yeah, you had rock and roll in uh, Candido and Lee, and then you also had, if you remember, that's when you had the the six man thing going with uh, Armstrong, Smothers, World Warrior Hawk, and Bedlam, Terry and Dory Funk in the that's coward. right, Flat that's hat. right. We we put the main event on the the end of the show because a lot of people are saying, well, why did you give all this away? It was a, it's a three and a half hour DVD with the packages and the history segments, and we only had a you know forty six minute show, but we wanted to put the best foot forward, and once again. That was a blow off. Uh, the heels are going in a different direction, et cetera. So to have a main event on our television program in front of a full building with the Funk Brothers and Road Warrior Hawk in it, along with Bob Armstrong, Tracy Smothers and Bruiser Bedlam, myself and Ron Wright, that wasn't just an independent wrestling show. That was some big names for 1994. And it was all part about, you know, we'd we made money on that show a variety of ways. It was one of probably financially our most successful show. We made a profit that night at the gate. Uh, we've made profit a couple of times on the DVD. We got a television episode out of it and made the promotion look 
a little bit bigger and more important than sometimes that it did on, on, uh, you know, this is something I wanted to bring up and I've, I've mentioned, you know, earlier, the way that we produced television in those days, we didn't try to get fancy too, too, uh, too big for our britches as our ma, as my mother used to say, we didn't try to do the fancy stuff that I see now every independent promotion pr- practically tries to copy the WWF and whether I'm, you know, whether instead of a Titan Tron, they got a fucking, you know, a, a big screen from Best Buy or the, the, I hate the backstage interviews where six people are involved in this weaving intricate thing. That's being shot by some guy on his camera phone. And they're in a fucking closet when they do it. We tried. And I think that's why the territory TVs are so timeless uh, in some ways. Yes, it, high def has come along and et cetera, et cetera. But the territory TVs were shot to look like a regional sporting event. You had an announcer with everybody. You had a background behind everybody. You had an arena with people in it. And you didn't try to get too fancy and do all of these modern tricks that expose, in some cases, the lower budget productions for being hokey. Your thoughts? <laughs> no, I, actually, it leads into something I think about that Brian and I talk about, but we don't talk about it in that way, is we have been talking about Risa Bowden in the ring. And it's shot real. And what I mean by that is he is left out, hung out to dry sometimes. But that's okay because in a real fight, a real competitive environment, he is not supposed to know. Uh, for example, there's an episode uh, coming up where an ad lib match happens and Reese's in the ring. He's introducing one team and the next team, that team that they're supposed to face does not show up. And out of nowhere, Reese is like, well, what's going on? And we laugh kind of, but in a way I'm pointing this out because it's, it's shot real because you're not going to plan it like that. I mean, you're going to plan it like that. But Reeser, as the announcer, who's the legit announcer on the TV, he he's like, I don't know what's going on. He looks at the ref and goes, you know what's going on? And ref's like, Rick Ferrara's like, I don't know. You know, I don't know what's going on. And then you see Dog and Lad come out. And then it's like, oh, well, we are going to have something happen here. And Reeser's like, well, it looks like we got another match. It's just, it's it seems more real. And it's because while Dog and Lad knew it was coming, obviously, Reeser had no clue. I don't even know if the referee had a clue the way yeah. he was looking. Well, so, and, 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 and that's the thing with, with, with Reeser, <laughs> the less you told him, the better off you'd probably be because you got those reactions. And, you know, and th- that's the thing is, is that it, it wasn't, the shows weren't written to be too cute. Uh, and, and two, uh, we didn't go over our budget trying to overreach ourselves. I always thought, especially with the OVW TV, um, you know, we had a, a, a logo wall in our locker room that we used for backstage interviews, locker room interviews and pre-tapes. And I never wanted to shoot past that because then you would see that it's a goddamn room with a couple of lockers and a bunch of folding chairs and bags. It didn't look exactly like a professional athlete's locker room. So stick to the logo. They see it a lot, but it's your fucking logo. But if you're roaming around the entire locker room area trying to do these shoot videos, all you do is expose the fact that you're shooting in an Elks Lodge. Um, there's, To me, the territories also put more emphasis on... The, the mat, the, if you're, for example, Memphis TV was live, so it had to be this way, but I always tried to construct my, the shows that I was responsible for, whether it be Smoky Mountain Wrestling or OVW or later on Ring of Honor. When you start the program, you are welcomed into the arena where you are based, where it's all taken place. Even if you go to videotapes or packages or commercials you're pitching out of that location and you're coming back to that location. You're spending an hour or two hours, whatever the length of the program is in that location as your base. And it's real time and it's happening. And even when you're pitched to a commercial, you wonder what's going on in the arena. A a lot of uh, programs, unfortunately, and part of this is due to the necessity of post-production and, and shooting a lot of stuff at one time, but a lot of programs, it, it, it's it, Heyman's ECW used to drive me crazy. It looked like it was edited in a fucking mix master. 
Because you were never in one location that you could say, okay, this is home, and now we're going to this package or this tape or this interview or this commercial. It was just all over the fucking place. I always like to have a base, and whatever happens on that wrestling program, you you technically you get the idea that it happened in an hour of real time in the arena that you've been introduced to. And that yeah, makes no. it more like an event. It's one I 100% agree because I haven't seen a ton of OVW, but just I've seen everything of Smoky Mountain. And you always started a show, you got whether it's Bob and Les or, you know, Bob and Dutch, they're in front of the sign at the desk, which it's it's a perfect opening to the show. Whenever you have the promos, post-match promos, it's always generally in front of that. The only time in Smoky Mountain you're ever away from that, I'll call it that set. Uh, you probably have a different term. I'm not sure. But the only time you're away from it is if you're in the arena, like maybe you did something at Night of Legends or, you know, Fire on the Mountain, wherever, Volunteer Slam. There are instances where, yes, you are not at that same location. But I get what you mean. And and I know people are like, well, well what does that mean? No, I, I agree because it's like when you watch Raw. And I, again, I don't even want to go down the path of because I, I, I think the talent there is great. They, there's a lot of talent, obviously, in, in WWE. But, you know, when you see hey, even even segments, even even great actors make some bad movies. There you go. It's a perfect analogy. But when you see the, some of the backstage segments it, to the point you're making, it's like, wow, they, they didn't do that a lot in good territory wrestling. I'm not saying they don't have some bad stuff out there. Let me clear myself up right there. I've seen some bad stuff in territory wrestling. But you think about the Mid-South show that Brian and I do. Brian, and you can attest to this, whenever they're shooting a promo, some it's either the guy in front of the ring or we got Watts um, with the with the Mid-South logo behind them or we got Dog or JYD or Roop with that logo behind them. They keep it real simple. That's really the only two spots you, you see. So, uh, Brian, did I miss anything there? No, I think that's an important thing, that it's always in front of that backdrop. So if a guy's saying something in a pre-tape by himself, there's an understanding of why he's there. And if it's not a pre-tape, someone's always there holding the microphone. Yeah. Now, every once in a while, when 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 physicality breaks out, as JR would say, and they get in a Donnie Brook and they go off the edges of the set, then you're like, oh shit, now we're not supposed to see that. But it was still at least with Mid South, there was people there. It was uh, you know, a packed boys club. But but that's that's the thing, is that I think Raw has lost the plot, as they say, from from when we did the reviews a few weeks ago, because it, it, you go so many different places. You just incidentally, every once in a while, come back to the arena and there's a match going on. But it doesn't seem to be the the, the meat of the show. Uh, and I always thought that uh, trying to appear live, even when you're on tape, and trying to make the arena the most important thing in the center of of uh, of of the universe for that program. It gives you uh, something to hang your hat on, but uh, uh, the problem also, when you're doing a lot of programming in the same night, we used to do up to four smoky mountain shows in the same night in the same building. And, but we would still take, uh, there was very little post-production as far as trimming for time and things. It was covering up, moves that look bad and and or bad shots that made us look unprofessional otherwise that was the extent of a lot of the post production and the occasional bleeping of a bad word um but what what we what we did try to do was was once again make it look like it was live to tape and going on at that time and we took preparations to to do a different open for each show uh, so that the people would would know what was going on in that program and see the announcers and establish everything, even though it took a little bit longer, you know, production wise. Then at the end, when we were doing four shows every night, or four no, four shows per night, and I think Chip Kessler was the announcer at that point. I started having him do voiceover billboard opens at the start, and we'd get. <laughs> that we'd shoot video of the people screaming and we'd do like a voiceover billboard cold open and then go right into a match at the open. But still, you know, it was, it was making each show a standalone uh, rather than just a, a mixture of tape from places. Well, it, and here's another thing, Jim, as you talk about like the production of it, uh, Brian and I talk about it with the mid South show, uh, doc and Harper and I, we talk about it with the BTT Smoky mountain show. And even when we talk NWA Saturday night on the other show, it's, you you generally have, especially Bill Watts was great at this. Uh, he, you you had someone who literally 
It was like a narrator. The matches were going on. And let's face it, you don't have five-star matches on one-hour TV every week. But you have a a promotion with co- a commentary team that's literally telling you the story that is playing out on TV. And if there are any spots that are you know spotty or things that are unclear... You've always got that announced team. In your case, it would have been Bob Cottle, Les Thatcher, Dutch Mantel, although Dutch would do it and spin it from a heel point of view. Yeah. They would but tell the story. They'd explain it. On. They yes. explain things. Yes. And that's, you know, that's something I've gotten a few good reviews for my color commentary here lately. Uh, but it's, it's something that you learn. You're you're not only conveying the message. You're, who are these guys? What are their backgrounds? Why are they good enough to be here? Right. You've got to uh, you've got to convey that, and then you've got to convey why are they fighting or what are they fighting for? What's their goal? What's what's the grudge between them? What is the 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 bone of contention? You've also got to talk about um, how dangerous they can be with their moves and their their uh, you know their demeanor, as Howard Finkel would say. And you've also got to cover up on the fly on occasion when when a drop kick doesn't quite connect or something, somebody, there's a malfunction at the junction and something looks a little awkward and you have to, to come up on the fly with a reason, a logical reason why that happened without wrestling being a work. And, and the territory commentators that I used to listen to and, and got a chance to work with early on were all masters of that because they had done hundreds and hundreds of hours of wrestling on television. And they'd let, seen everything. Let me ask you a question as you talk about the territory commentators. And I know this is this will be so hard to do because there's so many, I think, just great ones out there. Uh, you know, you think about people like Bill Watts, Jim Ross, um, Lance Russell, this is a loaded question. Who was the best in the territories at telling that story and narrating it where, where, you know, they explained to you the things that you may not have seen and noticed and wanted to make sure the point was made as to why something happened and why an action, you know, didn't make sense or should make more sense to well, you as a, as a viewer at home. The best territory commentator it, it basically doesn't exist because the, a lot of them were all right for their locations and for their product and for their promoter. The way that Eddie Graham wanted to present wrestling, Gordon Soley was his guy. And that's why Gordon Soley was there for 20 something years, because nobody could convey the true sport, the amateur backgrounds, the drama that Eddie Graham liked to build. than a guy like Gordon Soley with that vocabulary and that voice. But then again, and and also he worked in uh, for so long in in Atlanta because that was a, a similar type of of promotion. For Memphis and the Tennessee territory, Lance Russell was perfect because he had the perfect flavor for that promotion, which was a different style, and and it was all about the personal conflicts, whether you had an amateur background or not. You know, it was all about the the wildness, the Fargos, and drawing money with personal issues. If you had guys like uh, Bob Caudill and Les Thatcher. Les did a lot of his annou- early announcing in the Carolinas and and got some experience there, and and guys in, uh, like that 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 were kind of in the middle. They weren't as it was it wasn't as hardcore a wrestling product as Florida or Louisiana. It, but at the same time, it was called like a regional sporting event with credible guys that you believed in. So it, the best announcers, I mean, uh, some of Vern's announced Gene Okerlund. Can you imagine him anywhere else but in the AWA with Vern Gagne with that cast of promo characters? I mean, the, you know, there were some territory announcers that were the drizzling fucking shits. I mean, you know, and I always thought the Sheik's guys were way too corny in most cases and the tuxedos and they were way over the top. And and it was just it was a corny style, but it worked there because that's what the people were educated to. But the different territory announcers that lasted a long time lasted because they were the best person at conveying the style and the product and the flavor that their promoters presented. And it was all different. No, that, that's a, that's a real good point. As I, as I rethink that question, that's true because you got so many out there who did such a great job. I mean, from the Lance Russell's, the Bob Cottles, La- Lance Russell would not have worked with Eddie Graham in Florida because Lance would have, well, that's a humdinger of an amateur NCAA movies got going on there. 
<laughs> but Gordon Soley, truthfully, wouldn't have worked in Memphis when they're painting each other yellow and screaming revenge and somebody's going to fucking skin the other guy. Gordon would have been, oh, oh you know, and it, it was completely different flavors. Sam Miniker for, for Bruiser in Indianapolis, and they showed that TV in Chicago. We talked about it earlier tonight. When we, when we were talking about Bob Luce and his Al's number one Chicago Italian beef fixation, um, Miniker was perfect for Bruiser's territory because he was that old, he was a glib, fast talking guy like you'd see in those forties gangster movies. He had the snazzy suits and the slick back hair and he'd have been a great used car salesman or, you know, one of those guys. And he had that slick patter. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to another edition of all-star championship wrestling. Boy, what a great program we've got for you that, and he called all of Bruiser shit, which was Look at him beating up Heenan, and there's the blood. And, and that worked. If Gordon Soley would have looked around at Bruiser and the Blackjacks and Heenan and the Valiant Brothers and gone, what the fuck have I gotten into? Speaking of comments, I got to ask you a Smoky Mountain Wrestling uh, commentator-related question. I, I, and I may have my timeline a little off here because I, I, we did this within the last six months, but I'm just not sure. I know Dutch leaves, and we get less who comes in. I had the opportunity to speak to Daryl Van Horn, AKA James Mitchell, the sinister minister a couple of months back on the show on, a, on our show. And, um, you know, he managed the mummy and of course, Kendall, the samurai, but I, I just, is this just hit me off the top of my head? What do you think he would have been like replacing Dutch in the commentator role with the way he could just pop off? And he was a lyricist in my mind. Well, yes. Well, but Remember I said the style and the flavor of things. And okay. I'm a, I was a huge fan. I'm a huge fan of Jim Mitchell. He would have been lousy as a fucking color guy. And here's the reason, because that's the first TV program he'd ever done. He'd barely managed on television. He was right. glib, but it's not all about being, he could have gotten himself over on color. But the question is, could he have got everybody else over? And could he have also, uh, in a lot of cases, because Part of the production was we'd get together at three o'clock and have a production meeting for an hour before I'd go run off to do pre-tapes and all the other stuff. And I had announcers, Dutch Mantel, Bob Caudle, Les Thatcher, Jim Ross. I could give the, here's your announcer bullet points, what shows to plug coming up and you're still to comes and they could call a match and get the guys over and cover up those things. If Daryl Van Horn had been doing color right then, he could have probably got himself over because he could talk. But he wouldn't have known how to call a match because he barely started managing wrestlers. So it would have just been an inexperienced thing. That's why I never considered that. Um, when Dutch left, I think I'm the only guy that ever produced a television wrestling show that lost one of his announcers to go be the booker in Puerto Rico. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, but that's because we we were doing a lot of television in the same night. And it, and I just wanted experience in all of those positions where I didn't have to, cause I'm, I'm in three segments of every TV show. Plus I'm back there watching the monitor in the locker room, producing from the locker room, telling the guy with the headset to tell Al in the truck that the last segment was fucking too short and we got a blah, blah, blah. So I didn't want to have to, I didn't have to listen to the announcers because I, I knew pretty, cause I didn't have time anyway and couldn't hear in that environment. I knew they were going to do a good job. That way I, I was tickled when I watched the tapes back later on in post-production and actually heard them for the first time. Yeah. And I remember early Smoky Mountain, maybe it'd even been like episode two or three. I know there was an episode or two where you did do commentary, but like you said, you had to be in three, three other segments. So it was kind of hard to do commentary and be in, in three separate segments. Uh, I it's did. Just, it's a possible task. I did color commentary on one episode of Smoky one, Mountain right. Wrestling. Yeah. And that was episode number two. And the reason Good. for it was, Episode one was Bob Caudle and Dutch Mantel. Episode two was Bob Caudle and Jim Cornette, simply because those were our two pilot episodes. Dutch had done color on WCW just a couple of years beforehand. I had been all over TBS. And if we're showing those TV shows to television stations trying to get clearances, I want, and Bob Caudle had been on TV, obviously, for years and years with the Crockett Show. I wanted them to see a bunch of people that they had seen on big time wrestling programs to know that we, we we weren't just some, you know, as Buddy Landell used to say, we weren't just some local yokel from the fucking Knoxville Kmart. We were international yacht brokers from Toulon, France. <laughs> no, and it, it looked good. I mean, you, you, that's one thing about Smoky Mountain that 
I think people who still have not taken the time to start going through it and really watching it week by week, the production given its time is really, really well done. I mean, you are to me, the era that you start that is right before the, the internet is exploding. You, you're, you're in like a, you're like the last, not only you're one of the last territories, but you're one of the last like, moments in time before there was widespread information sharing like a blast furnace out to the world i considered the smoky mountain territory my my gilligan's island where it was the last remaining bastion of we're presenting wrestling and a, a majority of the people in this fucking building at least believe that some of it has an element of credibility to it that was the last place so i take pride in that but um but you know and and that's the thing and that's why i mentioned i i i there was too much of me on the show, obviously. Uh, that's why I didn't do any more color. Um, I would have backed off of some of me, but once again, uh, you know, whether it's name value with the viewers, whether it's name value with television stations and sponsors, whether it's I'm the one that can tell the story verbally, whether it's I don't have to pay myself, I won't walk out on myself uh, or hold myself up for more money or refuse to drop something. <laughs> <laughs> I will do all those things for me. So I, I had to be on quite a bit, but I always tried to back it up. And I more often than not tried to use my notoriety. I, we got heat when the time was to get heat, but I always tried to make sure that the baby faces in the end somehow left me a, a bloody on a stretcher with cake on my face, halfway naked in the ring or in some way other. I've, I've got my comeuppance because I had enough heat in the bank that, that I didn't need all of it. If that makes you know, any sense. It, it does. It does. I mean, you, you had to do it that way. Is there anything like from a production standpoint that you think you didn't take advantage enough of during Smoky Mountains run? I think we took advantage of every bit of production that we, you know, the budget, by <laughs> the way, and some shows were a little bit more and some shows were a little bit less, but for a one hour television show, not only shot and post-produced, but also duplicated on tape and with a, a separate tape delivered to each television station that we aired on, which at one point was at least a dozen. Our budget for each show was about four grand, forty five hundred dollars. That's with talent and everything. <laughs> that that's why we did four of them in one night and and split a lot of those costs because you know that was still when you used to have to pull a truck up to do television. Now they can do it out of fucking people's suitcases. But having said that, the obviously all of wrestling economics was different in those days. But when you can do something that looks like that for four grand, even in those days, that was a pretty good accomplishment. We pinched every penny we could till our fingers were copper colored and squeezed every nickel until the buffalo farted. And that's why, you know, Lance Storm and a bunch of guys that, that came through there still, I still have the microphone on my desk here at, at Castle Cornet, but the microphone that we used when we didn't have the official camera from Tennessee Production Center, the, the three-quarter inch Umatic camera and deck, I had a high eight millimeter camcorder that I carried around and I got a, a clip-on microphone from Radio Shack that fit the jack, but I, I taped the clip-on microphone to a pencil so that you could handhold it and do stand-up stick interviews. <laughs> And that's, <laughs> that's what we used for roving packages, right? The gangsters in the graveyard was shot with a camcorder and a fucking uh, Radio Shack microphone taped to a pencil. So we got everything we could out of that fucking show. And, I, and once again, that did an eight rating, ladies and gentlemen, in Knoxville, one of those television programs. So that's what, when I first went to work, for TBS, when Turner Broadcasting took over and, and we started seeing some of the things they were doing technically, but they were like, well, now business should be up because we're making all these upgrades. I said, look, Bill Watts put 23,000 people in the Superdome with a VHS tape because that, when they went on the search for Stagger Lee, that was pretty much VHS camcorder footage there too. It's not how you shoot it. Ultimately, it's what you shoot. Nowadays, you've got to look competitive but it's still the content rather than the 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 vince always liked to sell the sizzle not the steak i always like to chomp into the steak because if i had a cold i couldn't smell the fur hear the sizzle anyway i always yeah. like the steak but 
Yeah, I'd much rather the the personal issue that wants to get me in there and in the in the the, the fight of it, the feeling that it's a, a big time event and a fight. And you know, if, if the production's not as great, I'm good with that. You know, you, you well, said you know, about- you know that that's something also that 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 we lost after the '70s and '80s was local television production of any kind, whether it be the local news or the local sporting events or even regional stuff, was was not state of the art. In those days, and the wrestling programs looked primitive, but so did everything else you watched on your local station. And the the new, I'm old enough to remember when the news had the fucking the cloud with Velcro on the back of it. If it's going to be cloudy, they slapped it up on the goddamn cardboard map. That was your fucking Doppler radar. <laughs> and it just unfortunately, um, as television has blossomed and increased in production, etc., that's where Vince got everybody was he upgraded the production to where he looked like he belonged with the rest of the programming, something like what I was trying to do with having names on my television program, but it it went to a whole new level. And now it's hard for, you know, smaller promotions and, and younger promotions to compete with that look. And you get disregarded if you don't have the look, but back then the territory wrestling programs, the one in Knoxville as Les Thatcher will tell you, just ask him, uh, yeah, they, that, that TV show looked better than the local news on that channel. They did the split screen and the instant replay and the slow motion. It looked better than the fucking news. It had, had a higher viewership than the news. That's unreal. Hey, hey, you mentioned that, that microphone that you taped to a pencil a second ago or a few minutes ago for the longest time we sat there on smoky mountain trying to figure out what the hell it was. <laughs> What kind? Okay, and, and, and people out there, bear with me. We're not talking about you know 1080 HD here. While while Jim did a great job, you only yeah. had so much resolution. And the copies of of Smoky Mountain that I have in my personal collection are you know taped off of VCR, which is now on a, a on a you know on a drive that I have. So it's a it's a little different. Your your grain your footage is a little grainy. So you but can't now the go. DVD of the Night of Legends event on sale at jimcornette.com. Uh, it's it's DVD quality, perfect, right off the masters. Look, it looks exceptional. <laughs> but but in, in these copies, we're like, what is he holding? Like, here's an example. Jake's Jake's doing it with his opening promos when he's yes, when he starts. yes. Jake had the pencil too. Yes. So I, I'm like trying to figure it out, and so Tommy Noe and I have gotten to know each other well just based on the show. And Tommy sit, I, I'm sitting there, and he's been answering a lot of questions for me, just like things that he's involved in, or I'll shoot him a message and go, Tommy, what 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 happened? What was the you know? Do you know anything more about this as I'm watching? And um, or getting ready to produce a show. So I finally said one day after two years, Jim, go ahead and laugh at me. Doc and Harper and I keep speculating about what kind of mic that is. I go, Tommy, please tell me what kind of mic that was. He just started laughing. He said that is a pencil or a pen with one of those clip ons taped to it. I fell out of my chair. Well, here what happened was we got the um, actually Rick Rubin sent me the height millimeter camcorder because he said hey if i've got one of these around the house uh do you think it'll help uh cut down the production budget i said send it we'll use it so he sent me a high camera right but i needed an external microphone because i wanted to shoot interviews with it and you need a an external microphone on those camcorders it's just so noisy the background the ambient noise so right. i go to radio shack they don't have a handheld that's all they've got i said fuck it give me that i'll make it work and i never replaced it <laughs> so that's <laughs> big hey you know once again but it created uh, controversy, but also you could hear. I'll t- I'll tell you a Tommy Noe technical story. This might be a good way to close this this program. I don't think we can top this. That same height camcorder, right? We don't have the television camera from t- from at, at the time we had left Tennessee Production Center. This was a couple months before we cl- late ninety five. We'd switched from Tennessee Production Center and we'd gone down to uh, Channel Three in Chattanooga. That my scene of some of my old triumphs in the summer of 83 there at Georgia wrestling superstars. And they were doing our post-production and they had a nice suite there. we got a nice editor, the equipment. You didn't have to hold a screwdriver in, in one of the sides of the two inch reel to reel machines to get it to fucking lock. Like you did at TPC. Anyway, the thing was that was farther from Chattanooga to Johnson city to then I wanted to pay for him to bring a television camera. I had to shoot one match that night in freedom hall for television, just an angle where we're going to kick the shit out of Buddy Landell or something. So I tell Tommy Noe, 
I said, Tommy, <laughs> you run the high eight camera. Shoot this match. Here's what we're going to do. Just shoot all that. And then we'll go. Because Tommy did a radio program uh, on a local radio station in Morristown at the time out of a little audio setup he had in his basement. So he would sometimes do voiceovers in his basement. I said, we'll voice it over at your place later on. So whatever. The, I can't even remember the match now. It was important. We had to have it for TV. We'd already pitched to it and everything. I'm at ringside. I think it was managing Tommy Rich, maybe against Buddy Landell. Tommy slides over to me with that camera. He said, camera won't work. What? <laughs> Camera's not working. Now, what he didn't tell me at that time was before the match started, he had run back to get a cold drink and he'd gone back up to ringside and he tripped over the fucking railing going back to ringside. And he dropped the camera, <laughs> but he didn't <laughs> tell me that at that time. He just said, the camera's not working. I'm like, fuck the match is going on. Right. And I'm, and the people there's 1500 people. there were looking at us. And the only thing I can think of, because it's my cat, I know a little bit of something about it. I said, meet me under the ring. So, so this was not obvious to anybody, right? Tommy Noe goes back to like he's shooting with the camera on one side of the ring post, and he slowly starts sinking below the fucking horizon of the apron of the ring, and he crawls under the ring, and then I'm on the other side managing the match, and I do the th same thing. Slowly, I start sinking until I've crawled under. Now, the people in the fucking front row, I don't know what the fuck, but I'm thinking I'm kayfabing. This is, it, it, the team is in need here. I get under the ring. It's dark. I can still see enough. No, I can't fucking make the thing turn on either. And it's, it's, it's when you shake it, it's something's rattling. He says, I've got my camcorder in the car. I said, how long will it take you to get it? I'll run right out there. Okay. So now he comes out from under the ring on one side and runs to the back. I come out from under the ring on the other side and continue managing the match. Now I'm, I'm telling Brian Hildebrand, Mark Curtis, the referee, tell them don't go home. The camera's broke <laughs> and they have to keep going until here comes Tommy Noe. It shows up finally with his camcorder, which was a VHS. I'm surprised we weren't just drawing like courtroom sketches at this point. Like Lawler got on TV in Memphis in the sixties by showing courtroom sketches, but he shot the match somehow when once Tommy appeared uh, miraculously, they went to the finish and we aired that on TV and it actually, and it worked, uh, I, you know, and, and, and we got an eight rating with stuff like this, folks. In some cases, we did consistent twos and threes in Knoxville and threes and fours in the Tri-City on an NBC affiliate. So we got, we, we, we definitely got our money's worth out of that television program. And then, and then I finally got my money back years later. That's why Vince owns all of them now. <laughs> Smoky Mountain Wrestling is one of the best episodic wrestling programs you'll ever watch. And I'm not just saying that because I'm on with Jim. Let me explain something to people as I say that. I spend at least three hours a week of my life uh, putting together not only watching, but taking notes on shows and then post-producing them for the podcast. So I'm not just saying that because I got to love it if I'm ready, ready to spend three week, three hours a week <laughs> on one episode that I do every single week. So well, it, hell, but Mike, hey, that that's that's faint praise because you told me one time that the worst five years of your life was third grade. So, nevertheless, uh, anyway, <laughs> thank you for being on. Thank you for keeping Smoky Mountain Wrestling alive on the Book in the Territory podcast. Where where should the people tune in to hear all these shows we've talked about and more? Wherever you can get your podcast, where you're listening to this now, or any podcast you listen to, whether it's iTunes, Podcast Addict, TuneIn, Stitcher, Spotify, just search Booking the Territory. If you can't find it that way, go to tinyurl.com slash bttpod, and I'm on Twitter. I always retweet it there as well, at Mike504Saints. So, just search book in the territory. You will find it there. And it is Mike, a Mike 504 saints. We can't tell you're from Louisiana at all. We just cannot. I know. I, know. I mean, that's what uh, the first 29, 30 years of your life uh, in new Orleans, Louisiana will do for you. And we have, when we worked there and the people all tried to kill us, we called it lousy Anna, but nevertheless, all <laughs> right, that's a program. And remember today's program and Brian and Mike and myself and all of us are sponsored 
by you know who al's number one chicago italian beef the the italian sausage sandwiches the chicago hot dogs the homemade hand cut french fries the polish sausages my god my lips are going to smack my brains out as soon as i get up there to c2e2 and get some al's number one chicago italian beef and until then folks join us again next monday on the drive through next week on the experience and we'll see you in chi town new york and points north, south, east, and west. Until then, thank you, fuck you, bye-bye, everybody.